So this is probably how the Titan sub failed. Actually, yeah, hear that? Okay, so a lot of people like my last video about how it really isn't the immense pressure that kills you at depth, you know, because otherwise it would kill other mammals like whales and the such like. It's actually because the water is compressed. You know, that thing about they tell you that water is incompressible, not really true. But if you take the pressure off, it expands into the void. It decompresses very quickly. In fact, it happens faster than the speed of sound in air. Which brings us on to the next question, why did the hull fail at all? The answer to which, as far as I can see, is so painfully simple that I keep on thinking I've just made some simple bonehead mistake here. And yeah, it turns out bones come into this later for almost exactly the same reason as why the Titan sank. Well, there are several animations out there who imagine how this might have happened. So when the Titan imploded... The latest now on the tragic end to the search for that submersible carrying five people to the wreckage of the Titanic. We're now getting a look at how that implosion happened. In this video obtained by Fox 5 and created by Brad Perry of Starfield Studio, you can see a simulation of what possibly took place due to the high amount of pressure causing the sub to crumble in about 30 milliseconds. All of which seemed to be laboring under the impression that the submersible was a coke can, you know, basically made out of an contiguous piece of the same metal. It's not. Nor is the mode of failure likely to be that of a single piece metal hull. But beyond simply being dumb animations, above all, they explain nothing. Not that inaccurate dramatic computer animations are anything new. I remember this one from National Geographic about a ship whose name I've forgotten. I'm sure it's not terribly relevant for this story. But it hit a big block of floating frozen water. Uh, what do they call them there? Iceberg. Because it turns out that ice floats in water, and that's actually a rather important element to this story. Until after the collision then, when those physics somehow no longer apply. Because computer animation physics. So yeah, we're going to take a look at why this is almost certainly wrong in every important aspect. By far the most probable mode of failure is a single pinhole leak from where we'll come to shortly. Now, even a pinhole leak in a sub at depth like this is fatal. The use of the air pressure in the sub is what atmosphere. And as water starts to enter the sub, it compresses that air, such that by the time the sub is half full of water, it will have doubled the pressure of the gas. And by the time it's halved again, that it's three quarters full of water, the pressure will have doubled again to four atmospheres. And by the time it gets up to seven eighths full of water, the pressure will be up to about eight atmospheres, at which point you are six axes of screwed. Even if the water stopped rising there, it won't because the pressure in the sub is only eight atmospheres, whilst the pressure outside is, is still well over a hundred. But even if it did, at about this time, breathing the air becomes toxic to humans because there's just way too much nitrogen and oxygen per unit volume of gas. It basically becomes toxic to you. Not that it will greatly matter, of course, because those water levels will keep rising till there's only about 1% of the original air volume left in the sub, which has now 100 or so atmospheres of pressure in it. But even if you could fill your lungs and hold your breath at this depth, you're still screwed. You see, when the sub is full of air, it has roughly the same density as water. And now it's not full of air anymore, it's full of water. But this ship can't sink. She's made of iron, sir. I assure you, she can. And she will. It is a mathematical certainty. Now, with most subs, you typically want to be able to control your points. Ah, So you'd have a central tube and a pressure hull where all the people are kept safe. And attached to this, you can have a couple of ballast tanks, which you can either flood with water to make the submarine heavier and sink, 
Then, when you want to go back to the surface again, you can pump out that water and the submarine gets lighter and rises to the surface again. Assuming you can pump out the water, of course. Men, us pump out of action! Permission to blow! Or, if you're really desperate, you have some high-pressure air that you can use to blow the water out of those tanks. No effect. All right, blow. Blow, I said! No fall ballast. If, however, you can't jettison enough weight, you're going to be sinking. I'll pull out. Pull out. Damn you, pull out! Now, these clips are from a movie called Last Boot, which is one of, if not the finest war movie ever made. We can't hold her. Now, early in the war, the U-boats were a real menace and roamed around sinking basically whatever they wanted. They're not so vicious. A time they called the happy time. Our recent triumphs. We dive to evade enemy aircraft, lost contact. Dive to avoid destroyer depth charged. This movie is set after that. British have stopped making mistakes. When the tide of battle is really starting to turn against them and the countermeasures are starting to be effective. And in the end, about three quarters of those who served in these U-boats died in them. Just to give you some idea of how heavy those numbers are, the US Marine Corps in World War II had some half million people serving it, of which 20-odd you know, thousand died and 60-odd thousand were wounded. That's roughly 4% killed and 12% wounded. But even without people trying to kill you, almost everything in a sub is fatal. Uh, if there's a fire, there's nowhere else for the fumes to go. And if you start taking on water, you have to get the water out of the sub quickly, otherwise the sub will become too heavy and you will sink. So how quickly would a single pinhole leak sink a sub like this? We're going to work in millimetres here. So a human hair is about a tenth of a millimetre. And a decent pinhole will be about eh, ten times that. About the sort of size of a, a millimetre. About the thickness of your toenail. That sort of thing. So there's a thousand millimetres in a metre. And a metre is about half the height of your typical human. The volume of the sub in this case isn't far off a cubic metre. Okay, so that there is a cubic meter. A cubic meter of air, but one atmosphere, like it is at the moment, weighs about one kilo. If you would fill it up with water, it weighs about a ton, a thousand kilos. Your average person, <clears throat> like me, weighs about a hundred kilos, which means that if you were to squeeze really tight, you can fit about 10 people inside a cubic meter like this. And if there are any sticklers for the little numbers out there who say, well, this sub had a volume of more like five cubic meters than one, well, fine, you can just multiply the final numbers by a factor of about five, and it really won't make that much difference. A human hair, which we're going to start with as our pinhole, is roughly a tenth of a millimeter by a tenth of a millimeter. And water enters through that at roughly the speed of sound in water, which is 1,500 meters per second, 1.5 million millimeters per second. So to calculate the water entering the sub in a second, it's easy. It's 0.1 times 0.1 times 1.5 million. It is the cubic millimeters entering the sub in a second, which it turns out is about 15,000. That's about 15 milliliters per second, about a liter per minute. So it's going to take a thousand minutes, several hours to sink at that rate. 
But what if the sub had a one millimeter by one millimeter leak? Yeah, like I was saying, roughly the thickness of your toenail. Well, at that, it's going to leak about a hundred times faster. So a one millimeter by one millimeter leak will fill the sub completely in about 10 minutes. And seeing as it takes well over an hour to surface, that's going to be fatal. But what if the hole is about 10 times bigger than that? So about a centimeter by a centimeter. That's the sort of size hole where you just about put your little finger in the hole. Well, this is going to be a hundred times faster again. So the entire sub would fill like that in about 10 seconds. So this is the problem. Any leak whatsoever at this sort of depth, water will enter the sub at about the speed of sound. And water moving that quickly is also kind of a cutting jet, especially for softer materials like, uh, like the carbon fiber composite, which is basically made up of carbon fiber and plastic. The nearest terrestrial example is pressure washers that actually operate at fairly similar pressures to the pressures that this sub would have been at. And probably the nearest analogy that you can get would be the uh, narrow jet. Peak PSI rating on your machine. Um, very rarely is it used because it covers so little area and it has so much force that it's pretty unsafe. This is the one, if it's gonna happen uh, to take your toe off, this is gonna be the one that does it. So my pressure washer here has an operating pressure of about 100 bar, which is about the water pressure you get about a kilometer down, which is about a third of the depth that the Titanic is at, and where this sub sank. Right, so here we have one power washer with three nozzle settings, one of which is the sort of point. I'm going to try on some of this polyethylene and also some of this sort of very soft... Um, whatever, interior brick type stuff. Okay, let's see what this does for us. Yeah, it holds up better than I expected. That's, yeah, that's definitely the narrow one. So also we have wide and super wide. Okay, let's try the brick. See what the brick does. Okay, that makes a bit of a mess in the brick. Yeah, okay, I'll admit that's not quite the demo I was going for here. Not that it greatly matters, because high pressure water jet cutters are used to cut all sorts of things. Now, to cut a lot of the hard stuff like bricks and glass and all that sort of thing, they usually add abrasive to the water. However, even pure water cutters will quite happily cut things like plastic. Like the plastic in the uh, carbon fiber composite. Why doesn't it work with mine? I'm not sure. Maybe I just don't have enough pressure. But nonetheless, this does give you a realistic visualization of what a leak in a sub at depth would look like. And that faced with the soft material like plastic, a a hair-sized leak would rapidly transform into first of all a millimeter-sized leak and then a centimeter-sized leak. Which brings us back to what is the most likely source of such a leak? Well, most deep sea subs are made up of a ball, conspicuously made out of all the same material, always in this case a metal. No joins, nothing fancy. Maybe a couple of seals, one for where you get in and out of the sub and one for mounting a window. And the reason for the lack of joints like this, we'll see in a second. The ocean gate was different. The ends were made up of a metal, titanium. Then comes the problem. The middle of the sub was a tube made out of a carbon fiber composite. Now remember in my last video, I said it's not really the pressure that kills you at depth. It's the expansion of water that's been compressed that kills you. 
If you could fill your lungs at these sorts of depths, it really wouldn't be that much of a problem, just like it's not that much of a problem for the whales. But critically, you know, at the deepest parts of the ocean, which is much deeper than where this sub failed, the water is only compressed by about 5%. That's the sort of thing that you can barely detect with the human eye. But when it depressurizes, it'll expand into a hole at about the speed of sound in water. But herein lies the rub. That pressure will compress everything else as well. So the factor that we're interested in is called bulk modulus. Basically, how hard it is to squeeze something. The bigger the number, the harder it is to squeeze. So the bulk modulus of water is about 2 gigapascals. Most plastics are kind of samey, including the epoxy that would have been used to make the plastic in the carbon fiber composite. And if you follow through the people who supplied the carbon fiber composite for making this sub, they have some data sheets as well that put the bulk modulus of the composite material at about 20. Still way more compressible than the bulk modulus of titanium that comes in at over 100. Really, really incompressible stuff. So this is some neat little demo I can show you about how having different compressibilities, that is, having a joint where one side will expand or contract more than the other, can be a real problem. Well, yes, I do. So now we have one piece of glass, which we're going to join to one piece of metal. And oddly enough, the metal being coated in oxide like this makes it very good for bonding to the glass. In the first instance, as you'll see, we're going to hold the metal pot in a wet cloth. So this camera down here is on a didinium lens, which basically means it screens out all this orange glow that you'll be getting on the on the visual light camera. So the metal will actually stick really quite well to the glass. I'm going to say the, uh, the oxide layer on the surface is pretty good at bonding these things. However, the metal kind of expands at a different rate than glass. Which, or more to the point, it shrinks at a different rate. So we're getting to the point now where we're almost airtight. Oops, almost there. Okay. I think we're almost there where we can start blowing. Yep, we got a nice airtight seal on this. Good seal. Let's even it out. You know, reduce all the stresses for when it cools. Okay. Out there. Do I actually have a nice seal between the two. Now the thing is that the glass actually, yeah, hear that? So that's what happens when one surface contracts more than the other. <laughs> Yeah, it gets quite hard to actually can to keep a join between the two surfaces. And this is basically what you would have had with the Titan sub. That when it was mated together, both sides had exactly the same dimensions, and so everything was hunky-dory. However, once it got down to its deepest point, the diameter of the carbon fibre wants to be about 1% smaller. It wants to shrink by about one centimeter in diameter. Meanwhile, the titanium doesn't want to change its shape at all. Now, with what I had here, I actually had a pretty decent bond between the two materials in that it was actually bonded through the oxide layer. How is the titanium stuck to the carbon fiber composite? 
with glue. Today is a critical joining of the titanium and the carbon fiber. That seal needs to be uniform and small, but not too small. Between the two components, um, really what's holding them together and allowing them to move together is the glue. And so you want nice, even um, movement. The glue is very thick, so it's not like Elmer's glue. It's like uh, peanut butter. All the things to the shortcut. Ceramic, ceramic, fiber, ceramic. And it's pretty simple, but if we mess it up, there's not a lot of recovery. Oh yes, yeah, so that will be the pressure vessel for Cyclops 2. It'll go to 4,000 meters, It'll be the deepest diving carbon fiber sub ever built. And this is the bit where I just can't quite but feel that, it, you know, am I missing something here? In that, if you take a look at the compressibilities, you expect at those sorts of depths, the carbon fiber tube to want to be about a centimeter smaller than the titanium ring bit. That's roughly how thick the blue line is there. And held together by glue, I'm honestly stunned it survived any dives. So here, everything is about matching the compressibilities of the two components that have to stay mated together. And therein lies the rub. The polymers, all of the polymers that would be used as binder in carbon fiber are pretty compressible especially compared to the titanium. And the carbon fiber, whilst it does help you out a bit here, it's mainly good under tension, not compression like it is in this sub. But that's a whole nother video. The bottom line is, the tube is more compressible than the end caps. The only way this could have possibly worked is if they used some exotic alloy of titanium, like they do with bone replacement joints. And it doesn't look like they did that. So what you're probably more looking at is the differential compression of the carbon fiber composite and the titanium resulting in a crack. Yeah, hear that? A pinhole leak, which would rapidly widen due to the rapid ingress of the water, further widening the crack and the rapid flooding of the sub in probably a fraction of a second. And when that water hammer hits the end of the sub, it's likely that the sub broke into pieces. It's a mind-blowingly simple explanation based around the most likely failure points. And it looks nothing, nothing like this. And that's today's video. I hope you found it informative. And if you did, maybe consider dropping a like on the video or subscribing to the channel. And as ever, if you really like the work of this channel, you can support it directly through Patreon. And uh, thanks for watching.